Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you're seeing right here is the first ever picture taken by the Perseverance probe after it landed on Mars. And that's because today, once again, we're going to be talking about discoveries coming from the beautiful red planet. A lot of new studies and a lot of new exciting experiments have actually been conducted in regards to Mars, mostly because it looks like we might try to go there after all, at least in the near future. For now though, we can actually try to study what's going to happen here, especially if we decide to colonize this planet. In today's video though, we're talking about this really exciting experiment with really exciting results. Results that indicate there might be a way for us to bring certain types of bacteria that create oxygen on planet Earth and to have them operate and create oxygen and a lot of different important nutrients on Mars. And as always, you can find everything about the study and the experiment, including the results, by reading the paper in the description below. Now, our story today starts with the surface of Mars. We always believed that this was a very inhospitable place. The atmospheric pressure here, for example, is only about 1% of planet Earth, even less than that actually. It mostly contains CO2, carbon dioxide, and small amounts of nitrogen, argon, oxygen, and a few other elements. For the most part though, over 95% of everything is essentially CO2. And we know that on our planet, CO2 is used by various organisms, including something known as cyanobacteria, to essentially produce oxygen and to produce a lot of nutrients that are often used by other bacteria and other different organisms. Cyanobacteria, as a matter of fact, are responsible for producing a huge amount of oxygen on our planet. And although a typical algae bloom, as it's known, is sometimes toxic, mostly because it also does produce some toxic elements, at the same time, it's also responsible for a sudden burst of various, very needed elements, including, of course, various sugars, including oxygen, and a lot of other elements that are used by different types of animals in the food chain. But generally, for algae to do this, to bloom and to create oxygen, it just needs a little bit of nutrients, specifically a little bit of nitrogen. It also needs a lot of water, it needs sunlight, and temperatures and pressure necessary for water to stay liquid. Now, technically, the temperatures on Mars do actually reach uh, relatively warm conditions. It gets to about 30 degrees Celsius here, or about 86 Fahrenheit, at least in some parts. But it also gets really cold. Now, the problem is that even in the warm temperatures here, you cannot really have liquid water. The pressures are just too low. Although, I guess it's maybe not entirely correct to say that it's too low. If we look at something known as the triple point graph, also known as a phase diagram, we can actually see the point where the water can become liquid and can maintain its liquidity. The temperature for this point is just a little bit over 0 degrees Celsius, with the pressure being around 700 Pascal. Actually, maybe a little bit lower than that, it's about 650 or so. Now, it just so happens that the average surface pressure on the surface of Mars is currently about 610 Pascal. So it's just a little bit below that. It's literally just a little bit below the necessary conditions for liquid water to suddenly start existing on Mars. That of course suggests that if the pressure was higher, let's just say a few million years ago, it may have actually had liquid water in some places. But the pressure here does differ quite a lot, and in higher elevations especially, on some of the larger mountains, like the biggest volcanic mountain, the Olympus Mons, which, uh, okay, that's my bad, it's actually not here, it's somewhere right here. For the Olympus Mons, the pressure on top here would be much, much lower, possibly three times lower. And so because of this, the possibility for liquid water to currently exist on Mars is pretty low. But nevertheless, what the scientists in this particular experiment decided to do is, well, they kind of cheated a little bit. They decided to see if you can still have very similar conditions other than pressure. They basically raised the pressure just a little bit. Well, actually, okay, they raised it about 10 times higher. It was roughly around 10 kilopascal, which means that they now had quite a lot of opportunities to have liquid water on the surface, with the evaporation point being roughly around 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Which means that now the water could suddenly exist in the liquid form. And so what the scientists in this paper did was essentially create this new reactor known as ATMOS that allowed the scientists to control the inside parameters extremely precisely. They chose nine specific conditions representing different types of atmospheres and slightly different nutritious conditions including one with a lot of nutrients and one that kind of resembled Mars but with a lot more nitrogen. And as I mentioned before, instead of using the exact Martian atmosphere, they used exactly the same amount of CO2, but added a lot more nitrogen, increasing the total pressure to about 10 kilopascal. And then they introduced the inhabitants of these capsules, the cyanobacteria known as Anabena. 
And anabena itself deserves a separate video because it's a very interesting cyanobacteria. For example, we know that it's capable of producing um, neurotoxins and often uses those neurotoxins to control the entire ecosphere where they're located. Essentially, they prevent certain um, animals like fish, for example, from uh, overtaking the environment. They don't do this on purpose, obviously, this is just a side effect, but they're really good at doing this nevertheless. They also tend to grow in filaments and create these relatively large strings and in some sense can also be called plankton because larger animals do eat them quite a lot. So they're basically very nutritious, they're also very useful to feed other animals, but also they're extremely good at fixating um, nitrogen, at basically taking nitrogen and turning it into something useful. And so by creating conditions that are similar to Mars but with a lot more nitrogen, what the scientists discovered is that this particular species was thriving in it, it loved it. Not only did it survive, but it basically lived there as if it was regular conditions on Earth. And though obviously the same bacteria in the Earth-like conditions were also thriving as well, it was really surprising to find out that the bacteria living in low-pressure Mars-like conditions were actually just as successful at doing everything they were supposed to do. And then they actually went even a little bit further. They dried all of these cyanobacteria and used it as a kind of a feed for the most famous bacteria, E. coli. Now, E. coli, despite having a somewhat bad name in the press, is actually really useful for different things, including producing medicine, including producing a lot of other elements that we usually need for survival, and we generally can genetically modify them to produce whatever we need. For example, there are already several techniques that have been developed to use E. coli to produce insulin, and also a lot of different vaccines and a lot of other things like biofuels and so on that can easily be coded into the DNA of this particular bacteria in order to produce pretty much anything relatively fast. Which means that by combining E. coli with the wonderful Anabina, we can technically create a really, really efficient factory on any planet, any moon. You have Anabina producing all of the nutrients and all of the oxygen first, and then E. coli takes all of this and produces something else that we need. This is actually not a very difficult process and it's been done here on planet Earth many times. But because of the overall toxicity of anabina, this could also be not even the best cyanobacteria for all of this. There are so many different choices we have, which means that a lot of new experiments using this Atmos reactor will most likely be using other conditions, other bacteria, and of course, possibly even discover something else, something as incredible. But I guess the next question is, well, so what does this mean for Mars? It still doesn't mean that cyanobacteria can survive here just by being placed on the surface. But if we bring cyanobacteria here and we add just a little bit of pressure and possibly give it just a little bit more nitrogen and possibly even give it some other resources, they can thrive here pretty easily. This obviously doesn't mean that we're going to be terraforming Mars or that we're going to be producing massive amounts of oxygen here anytime soon yet, but it is a good first step in trying to discover if we can actually do this at some point. And although Mars is definitely not going to look this way anytime soon just yet, by conducting these experiments and by essentially publishing these papers, we're technically getting closer and closer to that moment when we can discover something that can help us, well, I guess you can call it terraform another planet. And also it's super important to remember that cyanobacteria in general is essential for everything on Earth. It was responsible for the so-called Great Oxygenation Event, it was responsible for transforming the entire atmosphere of our planet, and it was also responsible for providing most of the, if not all of the, early oxygen to the planet. All of the life that followed depended on cyanobacteria for the survival. So maybe, just maybe, we might find a way to take all of this and to then bring it to another planet, hoping that something similar might happen there as well. Now, for all we know, it could be Mars, but possibly some other object somewhere else. Which is why these experiments are so crucial in helping us understand how far we can take science in order to help ourselves in reaching new heights in terms of space exploration, space colonization, and potentially terraforming a completely new world. But for now, unfortunately Mars is still going to look this way for the foreseeable future. Maybe these guys will help Mars transform, but also maybe not. Honestly, only the future will tell. For now, check out the paper in the description, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support us channel Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. And either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.